Hello everyone, I think we're going to go ahead here and uh, get started. Uh, once again, we're actually starting off, thank you for uh, attending another one of our Lab Chart Mastery series. Uh, today we're going to cover cardiovascular analysis, uh, optimizing your blood pressure and pressure volume recordings. Uh, my name is David Rehm. I'm the technical support engineer for AD Instruments North America, and I'm based out of our Colorado Springs, Colorado office. And I think more than a few of you out there know me. I see some very familiar names out there in the attendee list. So uh, before we get going today with the actual webinar, we wanna, I want to talk about some particulars both with uh, the webinar, how you can interact with me, uh, as well as uh, some kind of boilerplate we're going to cover and some schedules as well for upcoming training. So first of all, well, I want to talk about the webinar guidelines. Uh, as you probably all already know, all audio from attendees will be muted during the presentation. Uh, this is just to kind of keep background noise down in the presentation and just to kind of keep us on track. If you do have some questions, uh, please definitely, or please, please ask them, but uh, I would request that you go ahead and do it in the GoToWebinar toolbar. Uh, down here is the Macintosh version on the left-hand side here, and on the right is uh, the Windows. They're very similar. Uh, just, just definitely type that question in there, and at the very end of the presentation, I will uh, cover them in turn. Uh, here's some upcoming training courses that we actually have. We just had one here in Colorado Springs, uh, Colorado, so if anybody out there actually attended it, uh, thank you for coming. But uh, these are actually pay courses uh, where you would go to one of our locations or, or to a, uh, a training building that we're renting, and uh, it'll give you everything from the basics of, of lab chart to advanced analysis, uh, for instance, some of the things I'm covering today. Uh, so the first one uh, coming up here at 13th, 14th of March will be in Boston, Massachusetts. And of course, this is uh, course levels one, two, and three. So starting from very basic lab chart to advanced analysis. Uh, then we're going to have our first ever in Dallas, Texas on the 19th and 20th of March. Uh, and then, of course, we have another lab chart training course here in Colorado Springs, Colorado at our training center uh, on the 10th and 11th of April. And then lastly, uh, we have another one in Boston on the 24th and 25th of April, 2013. Regarding up-and-coming webinars, uh, we're going to do actually a first for us as well, priming and operating your Radnaughty working heart system on the 27th of March. Uh, any of you out there uh, doing working hard, Langendorf, uh, you name it, uh, this is definitely something you want to watch. Uh, we're not going to go over base. We're not going to go over actual assembly, but we will cover once we have it all together. How do we prime it? What does the fluid flow look like? How can I configure my Radnaughty glassware uh, to perform the experiment I'm looking to do? And then after that, we're going to have a video capture module uh, webinar, very useful, uh, syncing videos with the actual data in lab chart and kind of seeing what's going on in the video at the exact moment we see what's going on in the data. Now if you're curious about any other upcoming events, uh, whether they're in person or webinars such as the ones that I'm showing here, uh, please go to www.adinstruments.com slash events or you can just go to our website and click on the events page and there will be tabs for uh, trade shows we're, we're uh, attending, uh, actual training courses like I showed on my previous slide and upcoming webinars as well. And uh, these next couple of slides we've added uh, just because we've had qu customers ask these questions quite frequently. Uh, you don't have to read all of this. All we really need to talk about here or the basic take home message is uh, AD Instruments products are not intended to be used as medical devices or medical environments. Uh, do not use our equipment to diagnose, treat, or monitor a subject. Uh, they definitely can be used in the clinical environment for research, but uh, not for actual diagnosis or treatment. Also, quite frequently, we get questions about, I have my equipment, what, what, who can I connect it to, how can I connect it to people? Um, we definitely use the uh, international uh, uh, safety symbols for either body protection or cardiac protection, as you can see here. So if there's direct electrical connection to the heart, of course, we have the, uh, the heart symbol here. Uh, if it's approved to be connected to human beings where there is no direct electrical connection to the heart, we, of course, have the body safe. And we also comply with the uh, European Union, uh, United States, and also Canadian uh, safety standards for uh, medical devices. Uh, another question I get quite frequently is, I have my power lab. How do I know that what I'm getting out of it is actual, is true? I mean, what, what standard is this held to? Get, held to? Uh, AD Instruments has actually, uh, we pay to get certified with the quality management system ISO 9001 and they look at our manufacturing and they look at our validation uh, 
uh, protocols to make sure that we conform to the standards uh, that I've listed previously here. Um, this is not a very uh, inexpensive thing for us to do, but it's something that guarantees that the equipment and software you're getting is of the highest quality and what, you, what you're seeing in it, the measurements you're making, are actual. So if you ever have people questioning you about, well, how do we know this stuff is certified? How do we know uh, the signals we're getting? Point them to uh, this. We can also supply certificates as well to, to say that we've actually complied with this. So that takes us through our preliminary uh, topics, and now we're going to actually cover uh, the actual uh, main topics of the webinar. So today, we're going to cover the blood pressure module, its settings, uh, the different plots that are available through it, and also some of the channel calculations that you can uh, perform with it. Next, we're going to cover the PV loop module. Um, we're actually kind of excited about this. We just released a new version of the PV loop module, and there's some big, been some rather large changes in it. Uh, we're going to talk about settings. Uh, the plots that are available, and also channel calculations. So without further delay, let's go ahead and move on to lab chart. So as I said, first thing we're going to cover is the blood pressure module. Now a note uh, regarding blood pressure and PV loop in the Windows version of our software both allow you to perform online and offline analysis, and I'll show you how to turn that off or on in the modules, but of course we're starting out here with the blood pressure module. So my example file here, we have ventricular pressure data, left ventricular pressure data that is, up here in channel 1, and we have arterial pressure data down here in channel 2, and I'll be using these to show you how to set up the blood pressure module and actually do analysis. So the first thing, if we once we install and turn on the blood pressure module, you'll notice that up here we actually have the blood pressure module settings. Also, in the toolbar, uh, unfortunately I have, it, I have it turned off right now, but I'll show you how to turn it on if you don't see it. If I right click here in the toolbar, right here, so I right click, you see we have options to turn on toolbar icons for blood pressure and PV loop. I left click that and we get toolbar icons for settings, classifier view, analysis view, the table view, and also to analyze. If I right click again, we can also do that for PV loop. So just little shortcuts, easy toolbar tips that we can come up here, click on, and go to specific views or settings for uh, both instead of having to go to the actual menu. So first things first, we'll go to the blood pressure menu, and I'm going to settings. I can also get there via the settings button in the toolbar. And we open up the blood pressure settings window. Uh, first thing you'll notice here is we have to actually assign a source channel. I'm going to use ventricular pressure for right now. Moving over, offline analysis, do we do whole channel or selection? Uh, neither one of these is right or wrong. It's whatever you want to do. If you have rather large files, I would recommend, or files that have noisy sections of data that you want to exclude from your analysis, I would highly recommend using selection. And we'll go ahead and use selection right now for that. To the right here, we can either choose between ventricular or arterial data, and we'll go ahead and explain that further, further down the road, but since I'm using ventricular right now, I'm going to apply that, and that will give us some options that we only use for ventricular analysis. Uh, we have a preview here of how cycles are being detected. If there's a green dot above it, it's definitely being detected. Cycle detection, minimum peak heights, uh, minimum periods. Uh, if you have problems with specific data, we would definitely come in here and tweak these features to make, make sure that you end up uh, actually recognizing the data that you're looking for. Um, just to kind of show you what things look like, if we change this, let's try to get this up to something higher. So. You can see here, once I made that minimum peak height up to 200, we're not identifying anything in our preview pane. But if I go down here to 20, we're detecting everything. So 
So we're actually detecting every peak as it should be. But like I said, if you're detecting uh, artifacts that you don't want to, you can definitely tweak these, these two parameters here to miss them and actually only look at specific uh, blood pressure pulses. Uh, end of diastole. Uh, how do we find that? We can find it from the pressure signal using uh, lab charts built in algorithm. Uh, we can also use the ECG signal if we have it recorded. We can tell lab chart where it's at and we can tell where to trigger off the maximum or the minimum of the ECG. Since we don't have ECG data in this uh, specific file, we'll stick with uh, find, find from the pressure signal. Uh, one of the features in blood pressure that it allows us to do is to actually average over a number of, of cycles. Uh, default is four, but you can set this as high or as low as you want to. We can just do one so it won't average at all, or we, we, can, we can do four. I'll leave it uh, at four for the purposes of our demonstration here. And of course, tau being one of the options we might be interested in, to, in with uh, ventricular pressure, uh, we can use different fitting options. Uh, neither one is right or wrong. Just pick one and stick with it. And we can also tell, tell lab chart where the fit range should end after in diastolic pressure. So now that I've gone that, I'm going to hit OK. And we'll kind of highlight the differences between uh, selection and whole channel analysis. And this will apply to every other module that we're going to, we, we're going to talk about today, as actually pretty much every module we make. Um, so I, I've told it that we want to do it for selection. So I haven't made a selection. We don't have any analysis happening here. However, say this region of data is what I'm interested in, and I want to analyze this selection. I can select it. We can go to blood pressure and click Analyze, or I can go to the blood pressure menu and tell it to analyze selection. Left click, and you'll see here that we've analyzed the selection. You'll also notice at the beginning and the end, there are the actually event markers are grayed out. Um, those are not being included in your actual analysis. And just basically the reason for that is the module needs at least two beats to kind of start uh, performing the analysis. And uh, that's exactly why here. So, but those will not be included. So if you want to include those, you might want to make the selection a little bit bigger. Now, if we go back to blood pressure and go to settings, we can tell it to do the whole channel. Hit OK. And of course, I'm going to go ahead and change the compression here so we can see the whole channel is analyzed. The entire file, I should say. Now, if we were to go back, go to settings, and say I want arterial data, I want to do that. I can go ahead and change our radio button here to arterial. You notice our options change here. Um, we actually can now look at the dichrotic notch if we want to and determine, we can determine its minimum height has to be 5% of the peak height for the algorithm to actually look for the dichrotic notch. I think for our specific file, though, we're going to go back to ventricular. Uh, all the same things apply with arterial, so I don't really think we need to go through and do our own separate analysis there. So we hit OK. OK, so we've analyzed things. Now what do I do? How do I pull things out of blood pressure to tell me uh, the disease state of the animal, to, to, to give me the information that I want to perform the analysis that I want? Uh, there's a couple ways to do this. The first is going to be the classifier view. And I'm going to go ahead and do a smart tile so we can see both the data and the classifier view. What the classifier view allows us to do is to remove artifacts from our analysis. So say we're moving along here and our, uh, our detection setting still allows an artifact to, be, to get detected and being classified as a good beat. Uh, we can actually remove it here. You can also see here if I go up here to blood pressure, I can tell it not to show cycle markers, these actually green dots, but I have it checked right now to classify all cycles as good. So everything's good. If I don't want that to happen, if in my classifier view I see an outlier, like say this one right here, that's not a good beat, I don't want it to be included in my analysis, I can move my mouse until I'm over this, the red line of this box. You'll see I get the double arrow. Left click and hold, and I can drag this down, and now that beat is excluded from the analysis. And you'll also see under blood pressure, that this is no longer checked to classify all cycles as good. We're actually determining according to a graph of cycle height versus cycle duration that those are not good.
and it's based more of a graphical interface of those two settings we can make we can make in the uh, the settings window, but sometimes it's a little bit easier to do it this way to actually remove uh, beats that are not good for our analysis. So I can just so again left click and hold, slide, left click and hold, and only look at the specific ones that I deem good. And you'll notice nice thing about the classifier view is each one of these X's is actually linked to the chart view. So if I go over here and mouse over one, double left click, it'll take me to that beat. And you'll see in the chart view, I have that little uh, decreasing uh, radius circle that appears at that beat to let me know, okay, that's what we're looking at right now. Uh, you'll also notice the ones that are not classified as good anymore are now red out here in the chart view. And if we move up and include them, they become green, saying, yes, they're being included. No, they are not. Uh, if you are analyzing, if you're recording data and analyzing in real time, uh, this, this view will populate in real time, just to kind of let you know what's going on. So you can have it open while you're recording. And I'll probably do a, uh, a really quick recording with our playback file feature later to kind of show you how that, how that looks. All right, so now we've kind of gone through and classified good beats. We go to blood pressure, and we can look at the analysis view. So you also see that it's detected things. So the view we're looking at here, the black line is the average of four beats. And it's probably very tough to see right now, but there's actually four green lines that, of course, kind of roughly parallel this line, and those are the four, four cycles that we're averaging across. Uh, you can see end diastolic pressure being marked here, max DBD, DPDT, max pressure, min DBDT. The blue line right here is tau, and of course min pressure that's reached during the cycle, or the average min pressure for those four cycles. If I go down here and move forward, you can see here in the lower left-hand corner, I'm going to go ahead and circle this, or actually spotlight it. You can see so we're looking at the average of cycles 10 through 13 right now. We're using 4 of 4. Once again, down here in the lower left-hand corner, we also, of course, have the scroll bar here. Uh, we have all the usual uh, range or uh, y-axis and x-axis adjustments that are available on the chart view. So, sorry here, I'm a little distracted by a chat question there. And as I, as I look through, you can see here too, for regions that I determined to be not good beats. It still looks at them, but they will not influence the analysis. So we can see here for these four uh, beats here, they're all red. They're not contributing to the average. We may have just one in there that is actually contributing. All good here. And we can just mouse through and just basically look at the basic shapes. A nice graphical inter uh, depiction of what the shapes are like, what the average looks like, and where things are falling. So this is great to look at, but how do I want the raw numbers? I want I want to pull the, this information out for my different cycles and my different averages. And the way we would do that is to actually go to blood pressure and go to the table view. Well, once again, you can also get to the table view and also the analysis view via the toolbar icons. Left click, and here we are. And it'll show us time of date max pressure, min pressure, EDP, uh, min pressure, I can actually move these out, or mean pressure, excuse me, max minus min, systolic duration, all the blood pressure parameters you're going to need for your analysis and for your research. Uh, we can also include averages of each one, minimums, maxes, the count down here. So everything you're going to need, and also how many were used. So probably for our last you can see here where we said that those beats are not good. It's only using two of the four beats in that average, three of the four beats in that average, two of the four. And it's just letting us know how many in that four beat 
average window, how many are being used to actually come up with that value. If all this is too much for you, uh, say I only want tau, uh, I only want the mean pressure, you can adjust that by going down here to options, the options button. I'll go ahead and highlight that so we can all see it. So if we go down there and click the options button, I can tell the blood pressure module what I want to see. So say I'm only instant, instant, interested in max min pressure, EDP, um, systolic duration, diastolic, uh, that's not, we're not really interested in that. Any of these, maybe contractility, IRP, and say I really don't want to see the summary information down here, these, these averages, these min and maxes for the specific uh, parameter. I can uncheck that as well. I hit OK and we change our table to something that we really want to see. Now you can export this table, so say you want to take these out and you have your own Excel uh, macro that you want to use to, to perform further analysis that you, you may want to, to do. There's the export button down here in the lower left hand corner. And if I left mouse click that, it'll bring open and allow me to either save the blood pressure table view as a text file or comma separated variable uh, text file as well. So whatever you want to use, uh, Excel has is very it has its own built-in parameters to actually bring these files in. So you don't have to save it as an Excel file. Excel can open text files in a variety of formats. So if you want to graph a certain way. Or, or do something unique to your analysis that Excel can do, you definitely can pull this data out of lab chart and do it that way. As many of you know, if you're current lab chart users, there's also an add to datapad option. Datapad is our own built-in spreadsheet program, or excuse me, feature. Uh, you can get to it from the toolbar tip here, datapad, or from Windows, datapad. Let me go ahead and do a smart tile here so we can see everything. So here's our blood pressure module table view. Here's data pad. I can actually transfer this data right here that's in the table view, add it to data pad. You see it populates out here. Now one of the nice things about data pad is we can actually go in here and do formula much like Excel. So if you want to do some mathematical operations on these, you definitely can. You can do it in data pad. You don't need to take it over into Excel to do that. Uh, the only thing that you might be limited to right now, and we're working on this, is actually doing any sort of graphing according to the things that are in the table view or uh, in data pad. Excel is a little bit ahead of us right now, but we are definitely working on adding those features to LabChart. So that kind of takes us to the end of what we can do with data pad. Now I'm going to go ahead and close this file and I'm going to open it as a playback file. And then playback is an, a, new a new file extension. I'm going to go ahead and quickly change this to a few less channels. And basically what playback is going to do, it's going to play this data file back in like I'm actually recording it. So um, the reason I'm doing this is I want to show you uh, some of the channel calculations that we can do and, and analysis we can do in real time with this file. So if I go ahead here, I'm going to go ahead and set up blood pressure settings. I don't have any data in here, but we'll just use the default settings for, for blood pressure. Uh, we'll do whole, whole channel analysis. That's okay. But one of the first things I want to do, if I want to analyze while I'm recording, I'm going to go blood pressure and tell lab chart that. So we want to go to this option right here. Make sure it's checked. Analyze while sampling. I'm going to go ahead here. There's also, if I left click on a channel title, there are blood pressure channel calculations that are available. So I can left click here. I can use the blood pressure module to calculate any of these and have them update in real time according to how we've set up the averaging. So this would be every four cycles that are detected. So let's just say I want to know the max pressure and I'm going to see it in real time. Uh, these are the amount of decimal places I want. I can auto scale or I can set the scale manually myself. 
Uh, if you forget or, or have other questions about some of the settings, and actually also in a variety of other settings windows, you'll notice these little question mark buttons. Uh, this will take you to the blood pressure topic in our help menu. So I'll hit OK. Uh, we can do a variety of things. So I'm going to go ahead and set up another channel here. Uh, I want to know the heart rate according to this. So we hit OK. And I start recording. Blood pressure comes in. Blood pressure is identifying in the top channel and we can see that it's actually populating down here. So we're actually getting our max pressures and we're actually getting our heart rate, which looks about right. I believe this is a rat file. You can also see out here in the classifier view as a recording, it's populating. And since we're saying uh, consider all beats as good, they're all staying inside that red box. And you can also see that our table view is populating in real time as well. We just keep adding rows. So very powerful. The channel calculations are great if you want to look and see what's happening in real time as you're performing the experiment. Make sure what we're doing is what we want to do and get the responses that we want to get. So that actually brings us to the end of the blood pressure module. Now it's a pretty straightforward module. There's not a lot of settings you need to change. Uh, and we've tried to really work on the uh, user interface to make it simple for you. If you have any questions, please go ahead and put them into the questions uh, pane on uh, the Citrix interface. So now that we've completed this, I'm going to go ahead and stop it. We're going to close this file and we'll move on to the PV loop module. Okay, so I have some simple PV loop uh, data that we've saved here. Uh, regarding the PV loop module, as I mentioned earlier, we have done a lot of work in it, and you can use it the way it's always existed here to do saline calibrations, uh, to do cuvette calibrations, all the other things that are out there for you. Uh, but we've actually added a new feature called workflow that uh, we've kind of listened to our, to our customers, and it, it can be a difficult thing to do calibration properly and to make sure you're doing it in the right steps. And workflow is, is, has been added to actually help you do that and help you analyze your data in the best possible way. So by default, it'll be turned on. I have it turned off right now. Uh, you'll notice, just as I said before, we have a PV loop settings and toolbar icons up here for the loop view. And we also have our PV loop menu. And you'll see down here there's this workflow mode option. If I left click on that, it asks me if I want to turn it on. It'll say exactly what I've said here. And this is available in PV Loop 2.0 is when we added work, workflow. I do want to enable it. I have the checkbox checked. I hit OK. And hopefully I can get it back out here. Sorry for the hesitation here. There we go. Sorry. A little bit of an improper way to do it. So first thing you'll notice here is PV loop workflow here off to the left. And you'll notice we have a bunch of different little steps that I can click on to go through. And it's just designed to actually just to guide you through the process of anal analysis of calibration. Uh, this is like this has been something that we've talked with customers a bunch about and, and many have asked for some way to make this easier. Uh, it's PV loop can be a bit daunting when it's your first time, so we've definitely we've given this to you to help you setting up the MPVS software as well as with ours and actually using the PV loop module. 
So the first thing we come to when we have workflow open is how to set up PBLOOP, the actual module in LabChart. You'll notice here we want to select the, the proper type of workflow. Uh, for those of you who have done large or small animal work, you know it's different. Uh, the actual MPVS hardware from Millar uh, requires different things. So small mammal will use a cuvette calibration, large mammal we won't. But for this file, I believe this is from a mouse. Uh, of course, we're going to use small mammal. Uh, we tell lab chart, OK, well, pressure channel is on channel 1. Uh, volume channel is on channel 2. So we want to go ahead and make those, those, those indications to lab chart so that we, when we go on to pressure calibration, conductance, uh, sampling, et cetera, et cetera, we can uh, go ahead and uh, it'll know where to look prop for the proper data. So the first step, always, it's, it's set out for you here. This is what you need to do first. Um, of course, we would have the MPVS software open right now. Um, I won't cover the MPVS software during this presentation. Uh, we do have a webinar out there that talks about it and how to use it. But uh, I'll just kind of cover, talk, mention it briefly, but uh, if you do want to learn more about how to use the MPVS software, uh, definitely look at that webinar or give me a call. So we've determined what workflow we're going to use for small mammals, set up our channels, takes us to our next step, pressure calibration tells us even what to do here. We need to launch the MPVS software. Wants us to start sampling, and we want to sample an actual pressure calibration from the MPVS unit. The MPVS unit can output calibration signals uh, under, I believe it's the catheter calibration tab. So we're going to pretend, okay, we've gone ahead, we've recorded this first block here, and we've recorded our pressure calibration outputs. So we've already recorded. And we want to go ahead and do the pressure cal. The way we would do this, here's our first pressure that corresponds to 100 millimeters of mercury. Go ahead and select across it to where we're nice and stable. So a couple of seconds data, data here. A second and a half looks like what we have here. Move over here. Left click on this arrow. It averages across the selection and applies that voltage value equals that millimeters of mercury. Next, go to our next step, our 25 millimeters of mercury step. Average across it, or make a selection across it, I should say. It averages it. Left click, puts the corresponding voltage value to that pressure here. And last but not least, we click the Apply Pressure Calibration checkbox. Once I do that, you'll notice, let me go ahead and do a smart tile here, that now everything here is in millimeters of mercury as it should be. 125. So definitely helping you through the use conversion process in lab chart, making it a little more streamlined, more specific to your data of the steps you need to do. Now that we've actually calibrated pressure, we're going to move on to conductance or the actual volume. So once again, we're telling you here, use the MPVS control software to sample conductance calibration values. MPVS software should be open. We start sampling, and in the same block uh, of the example file, we've output on the volume channel the MPVS cali uh, calibration values to get to uh, uh, RVUs for the specific uh, volume. And these are just placeholder units, just something that will make sense to us uh, while we're performing analysis and doing other calibrations. Uh, the MPVS software has the option of either doing millisiemens or RVUs. For the specific file we're using RVUs, you can use millisiemens. Neither is wrong. So if I select down here across our calibration step, just like the pressure calibration, we go here and left click the uh, arrow button. It gives me an average across that selection, and that equals five RVUs. We go up here again. Select across the region where we've gone up to 50 RVUs, left click, gives us our average, and we can apply the conductance calibration. And you can see on channel 2 now, all of our data is in RVUs. So relative volume units. And like I said, this is just a placeholder unit that allows us to have something that makes sense so we don't get any negative voltage values. Uh, as you can see here, uh, the Molar MPVS unit puts out a uh, between uh, plus or minus 10. 
So that's kind of, that's kind of tough for the actual PB loop kind of equations to work with. So we definitely we move it over to RVU so that what we kind of see makes some sense while we're recording data. So that we, now that we've cal calibrated volume with RVUs, we move on to sampling. Uh, you can see here, we perform, this is where we perform our experiment. We collect our baseline data, our occlusion data. Uh, we also get a saline bolus data as well as QVET well data. Uh, you can adjust detect detection settings if you want to in here. Uh, there is a toolbar tip here. If I left click, it'll bring up the PB loop settings window. Uh, you can also access the PB loop settings window from here. This is kind of the old way of doing things. Uh, we can tell it to do a select, to analyze a selection. Usually the best way to do it for PV loop because we're going to look at, you know, unique areas of data. Uh, you can tell it to do the whole channel if you want to. Uh, you can see the preview here. You know, we can also set the data sources here in the settings window. And we can also tell it where do we find loop detection. Is it from an ECG uh, or do we do it from the pressure signal? If we do it from the pressure signal, just like blood pressure, what is the minimum peak height? What is the minimum period in seconds? So we can also change it to milliseconds here. Just tell PV loop this is where this is a good event that you need to start analyzing. We hit OK. And we say, OK, we've completed our sampling. So we've gone through, we've sampled a bunch of data. We have a bunch of uh, left ventricular data. Gone through this file is actually relatively long. Uh, in this file, this is also the example file that comes with PV loop. So if you want to know more about look at specific regions, what data should look like for things, uh, they are marked in here with comments. So if I go up here to the comment list, you can see here our pressure calibration is, is marked, our conductance calibration is marked, pre-saline baselines at 5 minutes, 15, 20, saline calibrations, baseline data, occlusion data, and also QVET well. So we want to have all this data collected in RVUs before we move on from this point. And this is where it becomes very useful work for workflow because you know when you're supposed to do specific calibrations. When can you do with the animal? How do I need to prepare before I get to the step? And it kind of gives you a nice outline to follow to make sure you don't jump ahead and not collect data that you need later on. So we've gone through, we've recorded our data, we've marked it. We can move on to QVET calibration. Uh, QVET calibration, as I said, is unique to small ma the small mammal uh, PV loop workflow. And basically, there's a specific QVET you will use with the catheter model you're using. Uh, they usually have four to six uh, wells of different volumes. And basically, it's going to take it from RVUs over into microliters. So it doesn't automatically come up here, but we can actually we can bring it up. So to calculate an approximate units conversion by entering known and measured well volume values in the QVET calibration view. How do I get the QVET, QVET calibration view? I got a PV loop. And you'll see we have this QVET calibration. I left click on that. I'm going to go ahead and smart tile here so we can see everything. And up comes my QVET calibration window. So I have known volumes versus conductance or RVU values. And basically what, what uh, uh, lab chart is going to do here in PV loop is just going to do a linear regression on the values according to how they should, they should work, uh, both for the RVU value and the corresponding known volume. For this specific catheter, uh, the conductance or the well calibration, we'll see out here, well one was not used. So we're marked out here in a, in a, in a comment. And if I go to the, the comment list and left click on that comment, it takes us to our QVET calibration. I'm going to make it small so we can see it here. We've actually done Q, two QVET calibrations, just so we have a nice broad spectrum of data that we can use. So how do I get these values up into this table? The way you would do it, if you look at your QVET, first thing you do is go ahead and type in the well values. This will be known for the specific model of QVET you're doing. Uh, definitely look at your Millar documentation and we'll tell you this. Also, your documentation will tell you which QVET you should use with, with your catheter. We didn't use well one, so we're not going to include data there. So we go through, type in our QVET values of the known volumes that are in them. Go here to conductance one, this is our first run through the QVET. Go to well two, since we didn't use one. 
in lab chart, highlight over a nice stable area at the Cubet Cal, and you'll see this button here, set from selection. And it doesn't average across that region and enters it here into conductance. We go through for each one of our well values, set from selection. Just keep going through here, highlighting, set from selection. Last but not least, well 5, set from selection. Now say we want to go ahead here, you'll notice we have our actual calibration values are being calculated. Um, one cuvette well eh, may be good enough, but let's go ahead and do two. You can do three. You can just keep adding them in over and over to, to get a nice average across for each, for each, uh, 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 for the actual uh, cuvette calibration. Uh, this is something new that happened with workflow. So we can go once again to our second cuvette cal. And you'll see we're getting slightly different values for that one, so it will average across. And you notice too here as well the order that we're collecting this data. The cuvette calibration is at the very end because we're going to have to actually remove the blood volume from the animal to fill these cuvettes. And if we have something like a mouse, it's definitely not a lot of blood volume, and it's not going to be able to do to live without that. So we go ahead and go through here, and we do this at the very end of the experiment. Uh, saline bolus would would occur before this, so you definitely want to want to record that data uh, before. Now you'll notice. I'm going to go ahead and make this a little bit larger. Here's all of our cubet ca cubet calibration averages, and we're doing this nice linear regression of this RVU value corresponds to this known volume value. So this would be our volume calibration. I'm going to go ahead and smart tile again so we can see both. It's giving us our equation, or actually our squared value, which is pretty good. We're pretty close to 1. And we can apply it to our data. So you'll notice, if I go down here and mouse through the data right now, we're still in RVUs. I apply this. Now we're in microliters. So we've gone, we've gone through and done our QVET calibration. Next thing we need, to do, we need to do is take care of saline calibration. What is saline calibration and why do we do it? Um, with the conductance technology, the Millar catheter, the heart wall will contribute to this. It will contribute and, maybe, and it will decrease the accuracy of your volume measurement. The saline calibration is designed to remove that variation, to remove the portion of the of the volume of the volume that the actual heart wall is 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 influencing, and just so we know it's just the blood volume we're looking at. Uh, to do this, we of course need to do a saline bolus into the animal, and we actually have some example uh, data of that here. Uh, you can kind of see where we did it during the whole experimental run, fairly fairly early on. Uh, a lot of times I get I get. Questions, you know, what should a good saline bolus look like? This is what a good saline bolus should look like to actually do the saline calibration. Uh, you need at least, say, 8 to 10 heartbeats. It needs to go ahead. Uh, stroke volume needs to increase. And we need to have this, this increase as well as in um, max volume and min, of course, which would give, which would give us this uh, 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 larger stroke volume. This is what you need to see. Pressure needs to stay relatively stable. During this time, you will see some variation, but you don't want to see a huge decrease because then you're affecting the physiology of the heart. So, what, how much should I use? How, what concentration of saline should I use? Um, whatever works. Uh, you might have to go through a few animals to actually play around and see what works for you. Um, of course, we don't want to put a whole bunch of uh, saline in and affect preload on the heart. Uh, we want to have, have too high of a concentration that affects uh, the uh, physiology of the heart as well. So it's a little bit of a uh, play of what you want to do or what you should use. But in the end, if you're getting data that looks like this, 
you're using the proper amount and you're using the proper concentration. Um, and we also had a question in a recent course, well, is this going to affect my experimental data later on? Uh, if you only do it once or twice, uh, the saline bullet should not affect volume later on down the road with uh, your actual occlusions. Uh, if you're with a mouse and you do it about 10 times, 11 times, yeah, we were, we're probably going to start changing uh, the properties of the blood, which will in turn affect the heart. But uh, if you do it, you know, less than that, get some good data, and then just move on with the experiment, you should be just fine. So we've gone through here. We have, looks like, about three different saline calibrations that we've done here. So we definitely can do it multiple times. We need, we need to actually analyze the data at these points. So since we're in uh, Analyze Selection, you're going to want to go ahead and make a selection. I'm going to go down here to the time axis and do it. So we have the start of the saline calibration. So right about here when it's really starting to ramp up and go almost to the peak here. So for a good saline calibration, it needs to be over a few seconds here, we don't want to take a really long time, 20 seconds to do it. It needs to be relatively quick, but not too quick. Don't do it in one second. Uh, and you want to see, you just want to kind of select over this region. You should have about at least 8 to 10 good beats, as I mentioned earlier. We analyze the selection. We can also look at the saline calibration window. I'm going to go ahead and do a smart tile here. And basically what you hear, we have the unity line on end systolic volume and in end diastolic volume, where, they're, where their volumes are exactly the same. With our saline calibration, where these intersect, that is, because we don't have any blood, and we don't have in, in either of these, we're just looking at heart wall here, where that intersects, that's the contribution of the heart wall. So that value where this line intersects is going to be the heart is actually giving us a kind of a, an inflation of about 23.435 microliters for this specific saline calibration. We can adjust the detector settings to make sure if, okay, we're not identifying beats as we should. We can do that here with the toolbar icon. Everything looks good for this specific file. We're going to go ahead and hit Add. And we actually get the parallel conductance or the, the how, much, how much is the heart uh, tissue adding to our uh, uh, volume. Like I said, you don't have to do this just once. We have a few in here, so we're going to go ahead and keep going here. Saline calibration number two, another good one. We'll go ahead and select across. We want to analyze the selection. We're doing it again. Get another value. Looks really good. Nice linear regression. Nice spread out. We have enough points. Hit add. And let's just go ahead and do a third one. Same thing, calibration. Like I said, if your calibrations look like this, you're doing a great job. This is exactly what they should look like. Or your boluses, I should say. Go here, analyze again, and add this third one. Uh, these will not average by themselves, but I would recommend doing a few and then just kind of picking the, the median value. So looks like the very last one, 22.05 microliters, looks pretty good. It's in between the other two, the other two and we'll use that one to apply our uh, parallel to conductance or our, our saline calibration to remove the influence of the, uh, the heart tissue. Apply. And we're done with that. Alpha calibration. What does this mean? If I, while I'm recording, um, uh, with with PV loop or actually recording PV data, and I go through and do all of this, and say I'm doing an echocardiogram as well, which can give me uh, volume figures. We can use the alpha correction to go ahead, or alpha calibration, to make the volume measurement even more accurate because we have this known good uh, volume calibration from the uh, the echo uh, equipment. We can actually apply another factor in there that's going to further alter the volume of the molar catheter and make it even better. So basically, all we would need we would need to know the stroke volume for the molar, and this is we after we've gone through all of this, we can go back and look at stroke volume over some baseline data. Stroke volume for your reference, so like I said, echo or I believe thermodilution can be used as well. 
just so that we know what the stroke volume is, we can go to apply it here. By default, it's one. It's one to one. We're not saying there's any, any variation, uh, but we can apply this correction ratio if there is a slight variation. And that's entirely up to you whether you uh, choose to do that or not. Uh, neither way would be right or wrong, uh, but it's, it's definitely up to you. And finally, we can go ahead and analyze our data. So we can go through and look at specific regions. Thankfully, this file is, is marked really well. I'm going to go ahead here to PV loop, and I'm going to bring out the loop view. There's two, there's, and then there's a variety of plots we see here as well. Loop view. I'm also going to bring out the table view as well, the hemodynamic table. And we'll smart tile all this stuff. So loop view as our loops are building. Obviously, we're doing a, uh, a saline calibration, so all we're going to have is increases in volume here. There, be no, there should be no pressure changes. That's the loop view of a really good uh, saline calibration. But let's go to some baseline data. With the analysis, we can actually tell what we're looking at. Is it baseline? Is it an occlusion? We go ahead and make our selection, analyze the region, and there's a very, very good piece of baseline loop, uh, PV loops. You can also see we're updating here for each loop in the hemodynamic table, much like the uh, blood pressure modules uh, PV loop, or excuse me, hemodynamic uh, table. You can export it as a text file if you want later on. There are options for what you show. I'm probably just going to do a few things here. I want to drop it down. Tau, of course. And all the, the hemodynamic uh, parameters that you'd want to know for your PV loop experiment. We also, of course, have a, have a summary down here that we can keep or remove. We can also add this to the data pad much like the blood pressure module. So we have good baseline data here. Uh, are we getting good things? We can go ahead and adjust the detector settings here, or of course we can go to PV loop and adjust settings here as well. Analysis manager is something in lab chart that would allow us to save specific analysis regions. Uh, so for instance, we're looking at baseline here. I bring up analysis manager by clicking on the button. I want to save this and actually go back to it and not have to reselect and reanalyze or anything like that. We can left click this. We can call it baseline one. Hit enter and it saves that analysis specific analysis selection as baseline one. If you want to get to the analysis manager some other way, you can go to window See if I can find it here, Analysis Manager, and it will appear again. So we're looking at baseline data. Well, let's look at an occlusion. We go to PD loop. Excuse me, we go to the comment list. We have occlusion. It looks like we have two in here, occlusion number three. Make our selection. Tell PD loop that we are not looking at baseline. We're actually looking at occlusion now. So it draws the appropriate ESPVR and EDPVR lines. Analyze the selection, and there's our PV loops from our occlusion. Uh, of course, we can go in here. We can remove loops that might be outliers, and they will not influence the analysis. We can change the ESPVR uh, fit lines, the way it's being done, linear, quadratic. Uh, we can tell a lab chart that I don't want to see it, or I do. Also tell this if it's linear or exponential for the EDPVR. I don't want to see it, or I do. And another interesting feature for this, uh, say I want to put this view in a paper. Uh, I want to do it, show it in a presentation where I don't want to open up lab chart. I can actually go to Edit, Copy PV Loop View, and also copy, copy PV Loop Regression. I can paste these into a Word document, into a PowerPoint. They'll just copy it as an image, and we can put it in there, ungroup it, remove things, change fonts, things like that. It's just another little bit of uh, another feature that allows you to uh, really, for the data, be very flexible and for you to use other, other programs that might do something that LabChart doesn't or doesn't do to your satisfaction. So 
Also, like I said, great for papers and adding them in. So I've done this occlusion. I'm going to add another analysis. We'll call this occlusion one. Hit enter. And it saves it. Um, say right now with analysis manager, wait a second, I want to go back and see baseline one. I can go back, look at baseline one. We change back to baseline data, and we can look at our values from that. I want to go, both, go look at occlusion again. We've saved that analysis. There it is. So that's how you would use Analysis Manager with uh, PV Loop. You can also use Analysis Manager uh, with Blood Pressure Module as well. So I'm going to go ahead and close it here, and we'll talk about more of the things in PV Loop. We've talked about the hemodynamic table. We have a variety of plots. Um, you can analyze while sampling. We'll, co uh, we'll not cover that because the, this file is so large, you won't be able to see a lot. Um, but you can. The loop view will populate. The table view you view will populate. There's also channel calculations that we can do as well in real time, and I'll show you those in a few, in a few seconds here. Uh, you can reselect analyze data. So if I go ahead here and move my cursor around the chart view, um, I say, well, wait a second, I want to go back and reselect that. It'll take me back to the, the loops that I've analyzed that are good here and reselect that region. We can clear the analysis, analyze selection, and of course, as we've seen before, you can turn on or turn off the workflow mode from here. So I'm going to go ahead and close the table view, and we'll talk about PRSW plot, preload recruitable stroke work. So we can actually look at stroke work versus end diastolic volume. DPDT max versus max versus end diastolic pressure, or excuse me, end diastolic volume. PDA versus uh, EDV, end diastolic volume. And uh, PDA versus ESP. I'm going to go ahead and do a smart tile here so all these show up. All of these are plots that are available to you. If you want to take these out and put them in a presentation, you can do that as well. You can go edit. It will copy that plot. We can take it out as an image, put it in a Word document, put it in a PowerPoint. And for each one of these windows, you'll still notice we have a link to the help menu topic for them. And we can also tell our workflow here to automatically tile the views when we open them up. So as I keep pulling them out, I'll bring it in and it'll tile them. So hopefully, those of you who do actually do a PV loop, uh, the workflow model works should work very well for you, make things easier, and keep you on track of how to go through and do the calibrations. What points do I need to do them? Uh, you, if you don't want to use it, you don't have to, you can go ahead and turn it off and, of course, access everything I showed you uh, the way you're used to in actually going through and doing the different saline calibration and stuff like that. You also see once I've accomplished something, we don't see the, the, the link for well, there's saline calibration right there if I go ahead and click on it. Key that calibration shows up. If I'm down here and analyze, it removes those from the view. Say, yes, I've done that. It's been accomplished. We have our green check mark. We're good to go. That brings me to the end of what I wanted to cover today. So that's PV loop. And I'm going to go ahead and cover the questions here in a second. Let me go ahead and bring up my presentation again. But before I do, um, if you have any questions about what we've covered today, uh, if you uh, forget something or uh, maybe it's not explained well enough def and, we don't, and you maybe don't remember to ask the question today, definitely give me a call. When you purchase our software and our, our hardware, uh, you buy my services. So please give me a ring. We, we never charge for support. Uh, here's my address, my telephone number, 888-965-6040, extension 204. Um, I'm on Skype daily uh, at adi.support.us, and if you want to email me, here's my email address, my first initial, p 
period, last name at adinstruments.com. So do not hesitate to contact me. Uh, that's what I'm here for, uh, not just for failures uh, with the hardware or if something breaks or uh, an, uh, an issue you may see in the software. How do I do something? Uh, that's definitely what I'm here for. Give me a ring uh, and just to learn more about LabChart. So I'm going to go ahead and here and look at our questions. Okay. Looks like we have a few audio uh, problems. Uh, we should be fine. Uh, I, we are recording this. If you have some audio dropout, uh, we definitely have recorded, so you might have to go in and, uh, and just watch the recording, but we should be have that covered. Okay. So there definitely will be a recording of this webinar being sent to everybody who's attended today. Uh, I have a question from Brian. Uh, is there a way we can set up our own workflow in other modules or in the program in general? Unfortunately, no. Actually, PV Loop is our first foray in doing that uh, to kind of see how it works with, with a module. And uh, if, if, if it's well received by our customers, I, I'm sure we'll definitely look at it for other uh, modules. However, PV Loop is so intricate. There's so many things you need to do. Uh, it really lends itself to workflow. But for instance, like say blood pressure, uh, maybe not necessarily, but it's something we're open to and we'll probably explore in the future if the workflow is, is well received. So uh, that's pretty much the answer to that question. Uh, and that's, I think, all we have here. So either I bored you to death and you to pay attention or I answered all the questions during the presentation. So uh, if, if you do think of something in the future, definitely give me a call or send me an email. Uh, please contact me if you, if, you, if, you, if you have those problems. But uh, in the meantime, I'm going to go ahead and sign off today. I'll leave this slide up for the next couple of minutes so you guys can contact, uh, copy down my contact information. But uh, I'd like to thank you for attending. And uh, if you have any questions, please answer them now. If you think of something in the next couple of minutes, I'll be monitoring the question uh, window here, and I can answer them then. But uh, thank you for attending, and have a good day.